I know now that actually abuse was the underlying that really lowered the self-esteem and then just made it more difficult for me, more challenging. When a child <laughs> is punished or degraded mm -hmm. or judged or singled out or excluded mm -hmm. because of something they didn't understand, it has a long-lasting effect. Mm -hmm. And adults should understand and know that. We should be teaching that. Mm -hmm. Because it tells the child that they're not okay. And they say, well, that's not true because nobody said a word. Mm -hmm. Our actions speak louder than our words ever will. Mm -hmm. That's so true. And so when you feel somebody that's basically looking at you and you have all this terror inside and you imagine they see right through you, you're crippled by your own interpretation then. Mm -hmm of what you think they think. Yeah. And my value system, my self-identity was created by what I thought other people thought of me. And so, yes, I did have supportive people in my life who, um, you yeah, know, they were stable. So my gymnastics friends, my mom was always there for me. But this was bigger than that. So right. whether they could say you're pretty and you're smart and you're funny and we like you in other situations when it was outside of that, um, I every depending on where I was, that was what my self identity was. And for the most part, my self identity was not very high. So um, I could function in my gymnastics bunch because I felt safe there. But outside of that, I felt vulnerable and like I didn't belong, and so it made it difficult. It made it really difficult to do, to be who I was created to be. You never did <laughs> recapture that ability that you had with gymnastics, did you? I never did. I um, quit several times. Um, I always went back, and I was able to um, compensate a little bit. I started some front tumbling stuff, um, but then I had another obstacle there because I have a weak bladder, and so front tumbling is harder on the bladder. So then I would have that issue, and I did go to the doctor and stuff. So this is just even more on top of it that made right. my self-esteem bad is why I'm bringing it up. It's right. like, okay, I have to wear a pad, I have to do those things, and in leotards, you can tell when you wear those things. Right. And so I couldn't excel in front tumbling, tumbling even because I had a weak bladder. Then I tried to do some more back tumbling, and what I did was I took the back handspring out of the tumbling, and um, I did like a round off double full instead, which is harder to do, but I was able, for some reason, the back handspring is what caught me up mostly. Now, there was other things still, but for some reason, I was able to kind of do a round off, and if I put a mat down, it was weird. It's like when I was tumbling, it seemed wide open. Everything was huge, and so like I didn't feel like I had any type of control over what I was doing, but if I had a mat down, I had a focal point, and I was able to go and tumble onto the mat. Like, the mat's going to really help with anything. It didn't. It was weird how it actually gave me some confidence right. to have that mat there, to have it smaller and not so big. And so that's how I was able to accomplish some of the goals that I had, and I was able to go further than... I probably um, thought I ever would with this problem. Before that, I thought I was going to go to the Olympics. There was no <laughs> end to it. I was like, oh, yeah. But um, once this happened, I thought, oh, gosh, I'm embarrassed, and, you know, I don't know what to do with it. But I love it so much, and I don't want to quit. <laughs> so so I was able to um, conquer some of the um, goals that I was setting for myself at the right. time but I was still way behind where I ever wanted to be. My husband even today says, hey, let's watch your films. And I'm like, I don't want to watch them. It's embarrassing <laughs> because I knew where I could have gotten, and I knew how much every day I struggled with that fear and not knowing where it came from. That was what was frustrating. Is I did not know why it was all happening. But when I talk about it now, um, I'm able to see, and through my schooling, I'm able to see, okay, yeah, there was um, a lot going on behind that traumatic abuse situation that affected my whole life that I didn't know about, and I was too young to know about it at the time. That's what's so important, that people understand that stolen innocence mm -hmm. is stolen confidence, mm -hmm. is stolen dreams, can be a stolen future, 
can be a soul in life. <laughs> they have no idea at the depth of destruction they create for these children. Mm -hmm. We really need to educate people, not just the perpetrators, but the parents. Mm -hmm. There are so many parents that don't want to talk about it if their child is molested. They don't want to deal with it because they're more embarrassed about what someone will think than they are about the concern of their child. I know that's very sick, but I've had a lot of people tell me that. Mm -hmm. And it's very common that we don't talk about that. We don't talk about yes. that sort of thing. Be quiet. Mm -hmm. And that devalues a child terribly. Yes. So you were lucky. Mm -hmm. You had mom that loved you and was going to do what, right, what was right, no matter what. She just really loved you mm -hmm. and was going to do all she could to protect you. No and then later I was definitely lucky because I've, yes. I've learned about situations where, you know, people blame a child right. and say it's their fault and why are you doing this and that type of thing or just don't believe them at all. Yes. Um, or just turn a blind eye and act like it's not happening. Right. And um, for me, going through this has given me an empathy for people and um, being able to see kind of, I go deeper than what actually is taking place. So for me, um, if I see someone, this is just how I am. I, I did my internship in the prison and um, when I worked with them, some people would be like, how would you work there? And there's all types of people, all different types of crimes. But what I said to them is that I go in, not judging, because that's not my job, and I go in looking at each person from when they were a baby. Each of us were a baby at one time. Right. We all were innocent. We all cried. We all laughed. Something happened to us from the time we were a baby to the point we're at. Right. Now, it doesn't mean it doesn't condone our behaviors, um, any criminal behavior at all, it doesn't condone that, but we can understand people and maybe help them to change if we can walk in their shoes and see why they chose the road they chose. Exactly. It's a choice. Right. And so maybe that's why I was able to forgive the person who did this to me, was right. because I knew he had issues. Right. In no way am I saying it was okay, but I know that it's his issues, not mine, and I'm going to let it go, and I'm right. going to heal and go this way. And it took a long time to get there. For the longest time, I denied that it even affected me. But I knew at some point, I was like, this is, this is big. As I learned more about abuse, I was like, it affects every part of your life. And so I need to see that. I need to acknowledge it, and I need to be able to say, okay, I'm letting go and start the healing process. It's also important to recognize that the power of forgiveness is for you. Mm -hmm. It's for you to be able to let go of the pain and the anger and the anguish and realize that as long as you have that, he's still controlling you. Mm -hmm. So when you can forgive him in his ignorance, mm -hmm. you can let go of that so you can go on. Mm -hmm. And right. he can keep his ignorance as his problem, not yours. That's right. You know, the nice things, when they go away, they take themselves with them. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I like the saying that um, forgiveness is unilateral, like you just said. That's how we say it in counseling, is it's unilateral. That means I can forgive. It doesn't mean he forgives me or there's any type of conversation that needs to take place. It's me taking the active step for myself to empower myself to go ahead and start the healing process. And... So that's what I'm able to do is I'm able to empower saying, okay, there's there's nothing, no communication that I even have to have with him at all. I can just say I forgive. Now reconciliation is different. That's bilateral. That's when two people come together and if it is healthy and if it's okay, then you say, okay, I'm sorry. And the perpetuator will say I'm sorry and you will see action that they are actually sorry and they're living out their sorry. Right. And that's when some healing can take place maybe within that relationship. And not all relationships or um, situations can go there. Sometimes it's just forgiveness. Sometimes reconciliation can happen. It just depends on the situation. Luckily, I know that now. Yeah. I didn't know that as a kid. Yeah. But that's just as I've grown up and um, as I've gone through this, I've learned some things, and it's given me kind of a desire to go out can help other people. Um, I have really worked on my self-esteem, trying to better myself and see myself through God's eyes 
And um, for me, I'm a Christian, so I can't speak for everyone. But for myself, um, that's what's more important to me is not what other people see of me, but what God does. And so that's helped me to go to school and graduate with a master's in counseling and um, get married, have kids, have a family. And um, I still don't know what God's going to do with me, but I'm hoping big things to where I can help other people through situations that have been stressful, abusive, and um, help them to get to a better place. Well, you're helping people now, right now, this moment that you speak and teach because there's so many that are so tied up in their pain they can never face it they can never admit it and they think they're the only one mm -hmm. and the first step to healing is to let them know they're not alone mm -hmm. and you just did that thank you i'm that's glad that i can help that's, yes, that's can. what i want is to be able to be an instrument for people and um they can use me to go forth and to start their own healing process and to build their self-esteem and, you know, we talk about changing the world and making it a better place and uh, counseling, that's what that's about, is helping people to find who they are, who they were created to be, find meaning in life and um, I think that that's where the abuse for me took me and I'm happy and grateful for that. You know, for some people they don't have these support systems um, to be able to do that. They right. feel they're alone, they don't have the opportunity maybe they feel like at the time or the support to better their life or to get out of situations and um, they end up in abusive situations. And I don't want to sound like it's easy for me at all because before the marriage I'm in now, I was married for 10 years and it was not a healthy relationship. There wasn't physical abuse, but it just was not a healthy relationship. And it was because I didn't see myself in a way of value. And so I was okay with just mediocre and um, a lot of turmoil in the relationship, just fighting and, you know, psychological stuff. And so it took me that 10 years after the gymnastics to really say, okay, I need to do something different. And... Um, I started in the 10 years to go to school, or actually right before I went to school, and then I got married and um, had a baby, and then I went back to school because we kept separating and getting back together, separating, and I'm like, i got to have some stability. So I went in to get a degree in social and behavioral sciences at George Fox, and then um, got that degree over some time because I had another kid and um, then eventually I was like okay this has got to stop 10 years of going back and forth and um, not understanding why I'm in this situation and why my relationship is so rocky not knowing how to build good healthy communication skills um, I was like I'm going to go back to school and I'm going to make it to where I can support myself and my kids and not have to depend on someone and do something with my life to help others. And so I went to get my master's in counseling and actually, luckily, and I will say it finally, I'm proud of myself that I did very good in school and I came out with good grades and finally felt good about myself and graduated and now working towards the licensure and getting my hours done and um, I'm in a good place now. All, everything that happened to me, I'm, it's helped to form who I am. I wish it didn't happen, but because it did, I'm using it as a springboard to do better for my life because it's a choice. I can either let it keep me down or I can do something with it and I chose to do something with it. I'm grateful that I was able to have the opportunities to do the financial aid and get to where I wanted to go. Well, you hit the nail on the head when you <clears throat> said basically that it really isn't what happens to us, it's the decisions that we make despite what happens to us. That's where strength is, that's where courage is, mm -hmm. that's where faith is, mm -hmm. and of course I named them backward as far as what really happens in the process. Mm -hmm. But if you believe it and then you finally get strong enough to do it and then you finally realize that you are personally empowered. Mm -hmm.
and you did a great job. You grabbed a hold of your life piece by piece and put it back together, not just for you, mm -hmm. but the person you are now is capable of helping many people do that. And you were right. If you hadn't walked through it, you wouldn't be the strength you are today. Mm -hmm. so, having people that came alongside of me to help me was important, and that's mm -hmm. why the counseling for me, I thought, would be a good way to pay that forward, to um, have karma in a good way, you right. know, and exactly. to just teach other people that they are valuable and have worth and there is a meaning greater. They're going to create that meaning. I'm not going to create it for them. They're going to find their meaning in life, whatever right. it is, but to know that they have strengths, they have abilities, that there is something better and um, to find what I was able to or I'm still in the process of because it's a journey. Of course. It's a life journey and um, I, I want to help other people with that who have been abused because it's a terrible place to be and you know, to even learn about situations worse off than mine, meaning longer duration or abuse over and over again, um, different types of abuse that really affect us and not having those support systems in place make it really hard for people and they often can turn to drugs. Um, gymnastics helped me. It was my coping mechanism. It was right. my outlet, like I said, and so I was still able to go there. Even though it was hard, I still found some joy in the relationships and in the things I could do right. that I was able to, you know, get the stress off, some of the stress off, um, and be able to just stay above. Sometimes I went down. Like I said, I had a low self-esteem, but I was still able to function in life, you know, and but some people don't have those things, and so... It's important for myself or other people to understand what abuse does and how hard it is to see ourselves in a positive light. It's hard when you've been treated badly. Um, yes, it it's hard when you've been treated that way from a young child and to not know any different and to be beat down all the time. To be expected at some point as soon as you turn 18 that you're supposed to be able to function like a adult that is out working and doing all these things that just we don't have the skills to do it how right. in the world that is such a myth anyway it really is a myth that suddenly you're going to have a birthday and you're going to be an adult mm -hmm. it's a process mm -hmm. and we can help everybody our children and other people's children make that process if we start early enough to teach and educate them about life, about people, about cause and effect, they're not going to magically know when they're 18 how to take responsibility for their decisions if they didn't start a long time before. Erickson's eight stages of development are really important. And you were talking about sometimes when abuse happens, we get stuck. And I talked about it, too, with my own situation. Mm -hmm. But if we're trying to build and form our self-identity and something happens to us, we're not able to move forward to the next stage. Mm -hmm. And that affects our relationships. It affects our just ability to function in daily life. Mm -hmm. And we don't understand what's going on, but it's there. And so we, it affects our self-esteem. It affects just our ability to go out and do what we were made to do. Right. You know, we were created to do things. We were not created just to be stagnant and to sit at home and to do nothing. And that's often what happens because we have a low self-esteem or we don't feel like we're capable of doing anything or we're just too depressed to. So. Actually, our joy comes from following our natural abilities and mm -hmm. improving on them. That's where our joy comes from. Mm -hmm. And that isn't the box that everybody tries to put us in. We need to be responsible and capable because we don't feel whole if we're not. Mm -hmm. So it's wrong not to help teach people to be responsible and capable right. because they don't have the 
understanding and love and self-respect when they have to rely on everyone else. Mm -hmm. It's crippling. Mm -hmm. It's emotionally crippling to be incapable. Mm -hmm. So it's important that every parent teach their child how to be capable. Not just financially capable, mm -hmm. but emotionally and spiritually and intellectually capable. You don't have to know all the answers, mm -hmm. but it's really a smart parent that teaches their children where to find them. That's right. Yeah, teach them where to find them and have unconditional love for them yes. all the time. So when they mess up, it's a learning opportunity. It's not seen as a mistake. It's labeled as a learning opportunity to learn from and to grow on so that later on, you're not going to have consequences of being right from wrong. Right. Uh, all those things that we learn from our parents, then we're able to uh, have those learning opportunities and consequences that are so much less than later on in life, like jail time. There's right. different things like that. That's what I tell my kids. It's so much easier now to learn to pick up your toys and to, to do the things that you're supposed to do than later on to get a traffic ticket for speeding, right? Yeah. If we learn that that's not okay, then uh, we can be better off later on. Also, if we learn to be responsible for it, we feel empowered. Yeah. Because controlling somebody else to be responsible for it actually takes more work than us being responsible for it. That's so <laughs> true. It really does. When you have control over your own destiny by taking mm -hmm. care of your responsibilities, mm -hmm. then you can start figure out, well, how can I figure this and that and follow my dreams that I love? Mm -hmm. You actually have some control of the positive influence you have in life because your dreams help people fulfill other people's dreams. Mm -hmm. they're, they're a gift. That's mm -hmm. your gift. Right. Use it. So we can do this yeah. if we can move through the stages of development and be able to be, become healthy adults. And we do that by giving support to others. I think from the research that I looked at is that you're isolated, you feel depressed, you feel alone, and mm -hmm. you're not able to go out and do things. So if we can come alongside people and lift them up and help them. Luckily, I had that for myself. I'm grateful that I had people to come alongside me and to say, good job, even though I didn't believe it. They <laughs> planted seeds there. And so right. I had seeds to be able to use. And no one can keep you down. And um, I think that, for me, that's what I want to do for other people. And understanding abuse is the start of the healing process. Being able to recognize it happened, acknowledging it, and um, being able to say, okay, yeah, this is a healing journey, and it's lifelong. I'm going to learn lots of things. There's going to be seasons of life that are hard. Uh, there's going to be still situations I'm going to mess up in. It's a learning opportunity. Right. And uh, take advantage of that and then hopefully come out a lot higher up there to where you can do things that you wanted to do. You bring your dreams back. You start having dreams and hopes again and you start building new goals for yourself. Right. When you can get there. <laughs> if there's something particular you want to close with. Um, I think we've summed it up pretty good in that, you know, I, coming alongside people is important and understanding the abuse cycle, understanding uh, how people get stuck sometimes because they don't have support systems, they don't feel highly about themselves, they um, feel like what happened to them is their fault, there's the blame there, there's um, maybe a lack of, it seems, opportunity to get out and to do things differently. Yeah, that abuse maybe continues into other relationships and makes it hard because you just don't know how to change that cycle. And so if we come alongside people and teach them, educate, um, just have awareness about what's going on and that we're not alone. Abuse is worldwide. It happens right. all over the it place does. and we aren't alone in the abuse, but if we can learn how to identify it and then deal with it and cope with it in a healthy manner and use it to help other people or to stop the abuse, then um, we've empowered ourselves and we've empowered other people and changed the world with that. And that's what I want to do. I want to be able to change the world to where I can put forth and be used as an instrument. It's empowering and I think it can be used to help other people to let them know that I can understand. I don't know completely. I can't walk in your shoes, but I can understand the feelings and the confusion, um, the fear, the con just 
all those feelings that are mixed in. The anger, the depression, um, the embarrassment. There's so many different that you can name. But understanding that, I can go in and I can see you differently and I can work with you. I'm not judging and I just want to be able to help. And so I think walking in other people's shoes and actually living it are good things to be able to help people to come out and heal themselves in the way that they are going to heal. We all heal differently. We all have different journeys and different paths that we're going to take, and it's a choice. We just have to point them out to people. So an abused child is innocent. Mm -hmm. They're not guilty of what happened to them, mm -hmm. even though the abuser projects onto them the guilt and the hatred. Mm -hmm. The child is having a hard enough time, but what's really pathetic is the person that abused them is a pathetic excuse of a man, if it was a man that did it, mm -hmm. or a very a pathetic excuse of an adult. Mm -hmm. And the way that our nation looks at the abused child in general mm -hmm. and allows the dual standard to blame the child mm -hmm. is something we really need to grow up and get over. Yeah. We really need to grow up and step into the adult world and have everybody responsible for their own behavior. How dare we condemn the victim and say that they have committed a sin? They haven't committed a sin. They have survived the sin committed against them, and we're going to punish them? That's insane. We've got a lot of work to do. Yes, I think we do. And it's a complex problem is that even the perpetuator was most likely abused as a child. Right. And so being able to see that, not condone it and say it's okay, I'm not right. dismissing it at all. Right. I don't dismiss right. the person who did it to me, but being able to see that and say, okay, we need programs out there for victims, first off, right. because they need places to go, they need to be safe, they need right. to be heard, they need healing. Okay, but then also for the perpetuator, just has been raised in that, basically. Right. Not saying that he doesn't know anything, because we learn along the way that there's other ways to live, but they feel, working in the prison system for managership, I learned a lot and was able to see, okay, wow, some of these people are given drugs from the time that they're little tiny right. kids. Some of them were abused, woken up, being sexually abused by a father, a brother, something like that, and that's what they knew day in and day out. Now, right. some of them came out <clears throat> and never went in and abused again. Some of them do. Right. Some of them went ahead and chose the other path and started abusing. And so being able to see that dynamics of what's going on and why it's happening, why some people choose to go a different way, but having programs out there to help to make sure that they this abuse cycle ends and that people can, you know, take control of their lives and do things differently is important. First off, take care of the victim. Make sure there's programs there. Don't right. take the finances, the resources away from the victims. Right. They need it. Right. But then we have to change the system and make sure that we also have programs there for the people going out and perpetuating these crimes. One of the biggest deterrents to crime that we could ever have is to make them be responsible for the crime. For example, mm -hmm. if a young go boy goes and he steals something, he should be put on a minimum wage job and have to pay it all back. Mm -hmm. A theft would just drop. Mm -hmm. But we don't do that. Yeah. See, we need, we do everything. We do the counseling and the game and playing baseball and everything except making him responsible. Mm -hmm. And so, the idea that they imagine that responsibility is too cruel. We're not going to eat that kid, yeah. but to put him out on the farm and make him earn the money and pay back the kid and never steal him. Yeah. We're making a, a, a business out of the prison system. Yes. And it's and it could be definitely a whole other segment and because... How many kids we can say that... And, and see, we've from got, the there. thing we've got with our repeat offenders mm -hmm. is that they're still not getting the responsibility. Now, the responsibility is what sets them free. Mm -hmm.